In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn. A son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. I love the music of this season. Who, who enjoys the music of this season? I do. I remember when Michael W. Smith came out with his first Christmas album. We listened to that thing year-round until the next one came out, and it was just as good. We listened to it year-round. I think those were back the days when we were commuting back and forth to Granbury. We're celebrating Christmas all year long. He had uh, boys' choirs and girls' choirs and different kinds of instruments and just really well produced. I love the old Christmas songs that are done new, the fresh versions of it. Every season I check out what's available on TV and I will TiVo it if it's good. And the one I TiVo this week is by the Gettys. Uh, they're an Irish couple. It was filmed in a service in um, Ryman Auditorium, I think, or the Grand Ole Opry Auditorium in Nashville with orchestra, and it was called Sing, exclamation point, and Irish Christmas. Fantastic. If you see that, by all means, catch it. It's really wonderful. Now, the older versions, not so much. You know, if Bing Crosby comes on the radio, I'm changing the station. I always like the old songs, but done new. I love the old songs because they're rich with theology. You know, sometimes they're known for their chorus, 
joy to the world, and sometimes that gets confused with Jeremiah was a bullfrog. But listen to the verses of Isaac Watt's song, joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns, let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground referring to the curse of sin. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. My favorite carol, it may be a toss-up between O Holy Night and God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. I just love it. It opens with, God rest ye merry, comma, you got to put the comma there, gentlemen. It's not, you know, God bless the happy gentleman. No, God bless you or rest ye merry, comma, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. May God's blessing make you merry, gentlemen. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. Not exactly true. We'll look at that later on to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. That is true. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn. The witch, his mother Mary, did nothing take in scorn. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came and unto certain shepherds brought tidings to the same, how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Fear not then, said the angel, let nothing you affright. This day is born a Savior of a pure virgin bright, to free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. O tidings of comfort and joy. The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced much in mind and left their flocks a feeding in tempest, storm, and wind. They just ran off and left him and went to Bethlehem straightway, this blessed babe to find. And when to Bethlehem they came where our dear Savior lay, they found him in a manger where oxen feed on hay. His mother kneeling unto the Lord did pray. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, all others doth deface. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. I love that song also because not just the music's just so phenomenal to it, but it's, it's my favorite part of the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2, which is what we're going to look at today. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So he's taken a census. The King James Version says all the world should be taxed. So this guy has some power to tax the known world and cause people to relocate themselves, to register for this census. Powerful. What a king. Kind of a contrast between him and the king of kings is about to be born. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Now, why is that important? Because this part of the world where the Savior is born technically is under the reign of the leaders of Syria. It's like the Syrian region. So Jesus could be called a Syrian. He could be called a Palestinian. He could be called a Judean. He could be called a Galilean. He could, could be called a Nazarene could be called a Bethlehemite, could be called a, an Egyptian. He identifies with all people, right? That he is the king of the Jews. So all went, verse 3, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So you had to go to where you came from or where you own property. And so being the head of the household, Mary went with Joseph. And obviously she was supposed to be in, uh, giving birth to Jesus. So speaking of a census, it reminds me, our nation is doing a census this coming year, 2020 census. 
And if you need a job, they have an employment poster out there in the foyer on the information that, I can't believe you're making an announcement for the government. Well, if you need a job, I'm making an announcement for you. The number, you can write it down right now, is 1-855-JOB-2020. It pays 18 bucks an hour. It's not a career, but you could be very busy. Meet some neat people, maybe lead somebody to Jesus. Who knows? Maybe get fired for doing it. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right, verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. So if they went around Samaria, this is a considerable journey, uh, maybe 90 miles, over 60 miles, definitely. To be registered, verse 5, with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, we don't know how long they were there, Days were filled with standing in line. Don't you just love standing in line in government offices? While they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths. No baby blanket, no royal pajamas, no rich robe, strips of cloth used for swaddling or wrapping a baby tight, and laid him in a manger. No crib, no bed, a feed trough for animals, for lambs, sheep. Why'd she do that? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, you may be sitting there, yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. Move on, Pastor. Well, the word in, I think it's kataluma, doesn't necessarily mean a motel. It means a guest room or a guest chamber. So even though they were from here or Joseph was, they probably had relatives here, no one made room for them in their house. Maybe it wasn't just because they were so jam-packed with people from out of town. Maybe it was because they were ashamed of Joseph and his pregnant girlfriend. They were engaged, they were betrothed, and they had this tall tale they were telling folks about an angel and a promise of a Messiah, but I don't want to have anything to do with that. There's a cave out back where we keep our animals. You can stay out there. Tradition says he was born in a cave. Could be. Could be. Could be they've been staying there for a few days, so it's not, not the most ideal surroundings. Verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, the angel of the Lord, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. Here's how you're going to find him, Sherlock. Here's your clue. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. That's strange. There will only be one child like that. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Notice they were saying it, didn't say they were singing it. You know, it's messing with your angelology, but there's no verse in the Bible where angels are singing. It doesn't say they don't sing, just none saying they, and they sang. They make declarations. So it was, verse 15, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven. I can see people going in their concordances right now. Just save it for later. Check it out. Come back to me. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, how could they find them? 
in a city at night that's got all sorts of people from out of town, so it's a packed out city, how'd they find him? Get a clue. Baby's in a manger. Mangers aren't in houses. People keep their flocks and sheep and uh, animals nearby. So, so maybe the manger would be out back or somewhere and look for a fire, look for people in the middle of the night around the manger, and they found them. So when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. It could be they went door to door and knocked, hey, wake up! There's a baby in a manger. <laughs> what? And all those who heard it marveled at these things, which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Verse 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Jewish children are circumcised on the eighth day because the law tells them to do it. And medical science has proven the eighth day is the ideal day to circumcise a child, a male child, because on that day the blood clotting agents in the blood are 10% higher than they are the days before or after. So the ideal day for the healing of a wound on the eighth day. Go to chapter 1, verse 31. The angel visits Mary. This is his proclamation. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Israel forever, and of his kingdom... There will be no end. So remember those words, and then look at the words of the angel to the shepherds. Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So good tidings to everybody, great joy for everybody. This is a reason to be happy. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. I'd like to speak to you today a little title called The Way in a Manger. Now, there's a little kid's Christmas carol called A Way in a Manger. I'm not sure you experts in Old English could explain it to me. Uh, Martin Luther's been credited with writing, with writing it, but I don't think he did because the German version is really awkward it sounds like and reads like a translation into German from an English song. So no one really knows who wrote it. But we do know the one who was the way is the way, the truth and the life, the only way to the Father was laying in a manger. It's as though the rich one did go through the eye of a becoming microscopic, developing in the womb of Mary, the Son of God was born in a manger. These things were made out of stone. Some of them were holes in the ground. Not an ideal place for royalty. While they're living under the dominion of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus is, ex is exercising his power. God restrains his power and sends his Son into a lowly, Where was the Messiah born? We're going to look at where, when, what, and why. Where was the Messiah born? He was born in Judea. He's going to be king of the Jews. He's going to come from Judea. Born in the city of David. Going to be the son of David who was promised a descendant who would have a throne that would not uh, be dethroned. He would reign forever. In the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. Beth is house. Bethel, house of El, house of God. Bethlehem, house of bread. He who was going to be known as the bread of life, like the manna come down from heaven. My body is broken for you, so eat this bread. Was born in a place called 
the house of bread. That's very significant. It was prophesied that he would be born there. Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Ephrathah means bountiful or abundant. So you, Bethlehem house of bread, abundant bread, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. The religious experts years later in denouncing him said that he came from Nazareth. There's no way he could be the Messiah because the Messiah doesn't come from Nazareth. Well, here's where he came from, from Bethlehem. We looked at where he was born. When was he born? Christmas Day, we celebrate his birth then, but I don't think so. We know he was born six months after John the Baptist. So there's a clue. We'll look at that passage in a minute. He was born six months after John the Baptist, which would put him in the lamb birthing season. This is why shepherds were sleeping at night out in the fields with their sheep, because you got to watch over your sheep when lambs are going to be born. You got to make sure they're okay. If a lamb is injured, it'll die, and there goes your income. which puts them around March, April, or the Hebrew month, Nisan 1, which is technically a first of the year for them. I know Rosh Hashanah is known as that, but if you go into technicalities, you could say this is. It is believed that lambs, sheep were raised in this area of Israel for the temple. So he's born when lambs are born, laid in a manger where sheep are fed. That's significant. All right, back to our clue as to when he was born. Luke 1, verse 5, in the time of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. Remember that. That's the part of the division he was part of. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division, remember the division of Abijah, was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot, so they cast lots to to determine when you would serve. You knew when your division was going to serve, but when your division was serving, by lots determine when you would serve according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And so he's in the temple burning incense and has the angelic visitation, promising him a miracle child. And of course, he argued with the angel. So to prove it was going to come to pass, the angel struck him dumb, made him silent. Didn't speak till the day he was born, and he named him John. All right, so this uh, order of uh, this division of priests called the division of Abijah, you can see in the Talmud. And, and every year there was a cycle of these divisions as to when the priests would serve, because they had lives outside of the temple. And so in the Talmud, you can look at to when they would serve. And that year, thereabouts, the time when this would have occurred, six months before Jesus was conceived. So you don't see Jesus in the Talmud, but you see the order of of the division of Abijah. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948, there's a priestly cycle uh, documents in there as well. And so working forward in time from there, the division of Abijah's serving time lines up perfectly with what the Talmud was saying. So we know real close to John the Baptist's birth, nine months from this time, nine months from from the time of this division serving. You see that? And so this would put Jesus six months later, which is the lambing season, The first part of Nisan, uh, March, April, depending on the year, and it's probably around 6 B.C. I know that sounds funny, 
but you can triangulate as to when he was born. We had a guest speaker here December 17, 2006. You can look it up on our website under media. Dr. Gary Stewart came and did a talk called The Star of Bethlehem. And using stargazing software, you're able to go back in time just by um, entering the dates you're looking for to see when the planets would have lined up. And once every 6,000 years, all the planets lined up absolutely perfectly, which was, would have created a huge thing that looks like a star. And that time in stargazing software lines up with uh, the order of Abijah nine months later with, with the time I've just uh, shared the theory of when Christ could have actually been born. All right. Now, what is December 25th? Is it just a pagan holiday that, um, you know, the Catholic Church wanted to Christianize everything, get these people stopped doing their paganism, let's, let's give them a Christian alternative? Could be, but I don't think it's just that. And is it just that bad to do that? Doesn't the Bible say, this is the day that the Lord hath made? I will rejoice and be glad in it. So does God back off and say, oh, that's a pagan day. I can't be around you people. Does he? No, no. What about the wise men? When did they arrive? When they arrived, the baby's called the child, and they would have left the east when they saw that planetary lineup thing, and something they read, they were astrologers, something they read in it had to do with king being born, and something to do with of the Jews. So when they went to Jerusalem, they said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? So we have seen his star. Herod caught wind of it, and he executed or had executed or tried to have executed all the male babies in that territory from the age of two and younger. So Jesus could have been two years old based on the time when they saw the star. And then in the story, you see them approaching Bethlehem, because the theologians told him that's where he would be, and they see another star that points them to where he is. What was that? Well, in his stargazing software, Dr. Gary Stewart determined that that would have been December 25th. So what a day to give gifts. You know, don't die fighting someone over that. It's just a possible possibility. The fact is he was born in humble surroundings. What was his condition? Wrapped in strips of cloth. <laughs> Lying in a stone manger. We'll look at a picture of that here in a minute, of one of those. Soon to be threatened with death. Within two years, they have to flee and go to Egypt. Here's a stone manger. Not very comfortable, is it? They still use them in that part of the world. Being in a cave, it could have been a pit they made, carved out of the, carved out of the uh, thing. The king of glory coming to a humble surroundings as a baby. And he didn't stop there. He humbled himself and lived as a servant. And he didn't stop there. He, hung him, he humbled himself and died a criminal's death, became sin for us, took Barabbas' place, and didn't stop there, went into the grave. But he's risen from the dead and has a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. So that's who he was going to be. The angel said he would bring great joy to all people, He'd be Savior of the world, and he'd be Christ the Lord. Let's look at that again. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the shepherds. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It's the gospel. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ or the Messiah, the Lord, the way in a manger. 
the significance of the manger reminds me of some other things about him. He's known as the chief cornerstone, isn't he? He's the stone for a foundation. He's who the church is built upon. For those that knew who he was, he told them, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. But prophetically, he's known also, I believe, as a stone made without hands. In Daniel chapter 2, the emperor of the Babylonian empire, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream and then couldn't remember it and brought in his wise guys, threatened them with death unless they told them what he dreamed and then interpreted it. None of them could do it. So they brought in Daniel. He says, I'm going to pray. He prayed. He pled for mercy for the guys. He said, no human can do this, but God, my God, our God, told me what you dreamed. He said, you dreamed about an image with a head of gold, and chest of silver, and belly and loins of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay with toes. These are the kingdoms of the world. You are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. But there's coming a stone made without hands. Well, let's let's look at it. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, without human touch. It's a virgin birth. Which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Like a snowball, the stone is rolling throughout the earth. One day, he's going to smash all the kingdoms of the world. So the kingdom has come in the person of Christ, and yet the kingdom is coming in the person of Christ. The kingdom is is within us, and yet there's the greater dimension of the kingdom. We read this every Christmas season, Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that day forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So notice, child is born, son is given, the government is on his shoulder. Verse 7, the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So there's coming a greater dimension of the reign of Christ in the earth, maybe in our lifetime. Look forward to that. It's not going to be achieved by our exercising our rights as American citizens. It's going to be achieved through Christ's kingdom, not any political party. This is pure Monarchy, not theocracy. Theocracy is with people. That's the way I understand it. But in the meantime, he's reigning in our hearts. We used to sing a song, Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of my heart. Jesus, I surrender all the kingdoms of my heart. It's who's reigning in this house that's more important than who's reigning in the White House. It's who's reigning in your house is more important than who's reigning at the UN. Who's reigning in this house is more important than who's reigning at the World Council of Churches. One day, His government's going to increase so much, the kingdoms of the world will give way to it. All the way back to Nebuchadnezzar, every shred of that foundation will be 
destroyed. Are you looking forward to that day? Lord, we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your grand arrival, your humble arrival, laying in the manger. But Lord, we're looking forward to your re-arrival on a white horse in royalty. The word of God coming to exercise dominion over all wickedness. So Lord, help us to surrender to your lordship this Christmas season and help us, Lord, to be obedient with the great commission and the gospel to our families, our kin folks, our exes from Texas, our in-laws and outlaws. Lord, help us to guard our hearts and not get drawn into arguments, but to shine the light of the love of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the promise we have in you. In Jesus' name. Do I have to tear up my nativity set? No. You can't make some corrections, though. Put the camels and the wise men, get some more wise men, and put them on the other side of the house. <laughs> Take the wings off those angels. Now, teach your children the truth. Use it as a tool for teaching. I wish we all had nativity 
setups in our yards. Wouldn't that be awesome? The church full of nativities would be great. We use them as teaching tools. It's what actually happened. This is what's available. Or make your own. Make it, make it, make it more realistic. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. His peace that is based on his conquest and not on our compromise. The peace that passes understanding that is not dependent on circumstance. Now here's where I say you'll get them tigers, but, but I want to give an explanation. Because tigers are the mascot of Glenrose. Okay? But I struggle to say go get them pirates. You know, because they're marauders, they're thieves, they're pillagers. But, as Mary Anna pointed out to me, we can be pirates to the kingdom of darkness. We can be pillagers to the devil, right? We can plunder hell. <laughs> Go get them, tigers. God bless you. That is who you are.